Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're gonna give people a few moments and then we'll get started shortly. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're just gonna give people one more minute and then we'll begin the presentation shortly. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we'll begin now. I'm gonna go over some few short Zoom instructions and then I'll pass it over to our team to begin. Thank you, everyone. So um, you're joining today on Zoom with muted microphones. If you haven't already done so, please rename your um, rename yourself with your first and last name. Right now we have the chat closed. It'll be open during the discussion section of the meeting. We'll make sure to read out, um, read out chat questions um, for the first 15 minutes of the discussion. After answering written questions, we'll then move to an opportunity to speak additional questions or comments out loud. Um, to participate in this, you can select the raise hand function. Um, you can find this by clicking the reactions button in your toolbar and a window will pop up with a raise hand button. Depending on your Zoom version, it also might be directly in your toolbar or through your participants window. And we will call on you when it's your turn and unmute your microphone. If you're joining us by phone today, you can press star nine to raise your hand. If you have any technical difficulties whatsoever, please don't hesitate to reach out to me at kwhite at somervillena.gov. And just a reminder for everyone joining today, this meeting is recorded. With that, I'm gonna pass it to my colleague, Viola, who's gonna get started on the presentation. Welcome everybody um, to another exciting meeting in the city of Somerville. Um, before we start the um, presentation, I'd like to acknowledge the counselors who, are, who have joined us, um, Ben Ewan Campen, Jesse Klingen, and I see Mark Niedergang on the um, attendee list as well. Uh, Jesse and Ben, would you like to say a few words before we start? Hi, everybody. This is Councillor Ewan Campen. Um, I am here to listen as well, and I'm, I'm very thankful to the team for putting this together, and uh, I'm looking forward to the presentation. Yes, I would just uh, echo those sentiments. I'm really excited uh, to, to see what's presented here this evening and uh, look forward to the many changes coming to Gilman Square. Great. Thank you so much. And with that, <clears throat> I'd like to begin the meeting. So the agenda for tonight is um, <clears throat> that we will start introducing the many folks involved, <clears throat> sorry, imagining and implementing the future of Gilman Square. Then we will give a brief summary of what is happening in Gilman Square, and then introduce the Medford Street Pro Street project, um, which presents one of the, and we will then present um, one of the scope items, Medford Street Bridge Feasibility, and then afterwards um, present options for bike lanes and tree play placements. And my apology in advance, sometimes my computer is a little slow, but here's the Gilman Square team. Um, it's a team of city and neighbors <clears throat> that have been working on <clears throat> various aspects of this square. And they are um, Rachel Nakarni from the city of Somerville in the economic development department, Sarah Lewis, who I don't know if she will be able to attend. Um, oh, she is <clears throat> with the planning and zoning department, Greg Jenkins, um, the arts council, Brian Postalweight, city engineer and director of engineering, myself, um, part of the mobility team, Justin Schreiber of the mobility team, Kate White, and then the Gilman Square Neighborhood Association, which I think Christine Carlino will um, add a slide. We'll talk about, it. we'll have a slide. So what is happening in Gilman Square? Many things, and I will hand it over to Rachel to start talking about um, 
what's going on with the home inside. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, Viola, can you advance to the next image? We'll see if, it, if the computer catches up with us. Um, but there is a lot happening uh, in Gilman Square, particularly around the redevelopment of the Holman site. Uh, over this past year, there was a um, massing and uh, uh, zoning study that was done, looking at different arrangements of how buildings would fit on both the Holman site and then the triangle site, uh, which is the yellow at the top of this image. Um, in addition to that, we've been looking at uh, the idea of incorporating the mobile site as well. So there were a few different ideas discussed in the zoning study. One that looked at what if it was developed as one site collectively, one if it was developed separately, and then a third if there was sort of a land swap where the line got a little bit squared. So that was a really great starting point. And where we are going next is that we are doing two things. Uh, first is a market study that's going to look at the economic feasibility of those different scenarios that were developed last year, uh, over this past year. And the second is to really dig in uh, even further with the community process to understand um, some of the decisions that need to be made. So the first being about the mobile site and whether or not that should be done in conjunction. One of the ideas here to think about is uh, what we've shown here in purple. That's this idea of a Richdale Ave uh, connection that would move through the site for pedestrians and cyclists coming into the core of Gilman Square that we're gonna talk about tonight and Menford and Pearl Street. The other thing we're gonna be looking at is sort of are the, the key features of the development that is to come. So what uses are people looking forward to seeing there? What kind of activations would people like to see out of green space that's developed at the site? We are going to be doing um, the first step of that process actually starting this coming week, uh, with, which is to recruit folks to join our Civic Advisory Committee. That advisory committee is going to sort of be a focus group to help uh, bring in broader networks to engagement efforts around the site and help us make those decisions. Next one, please. Perfect. So the Holman site uh, and the Triangle site, which are the city-owned parcels, that's not the only thing that's happening uh, in Gilman Square right now. I uh, want to just highlight a few other things that are moving forward. So first, um, on the right-hand side of the screen is the Somerville High School Fields. That is going to continue to take shape over the next um, construction season in the spring. Uh, then highlighted in blue is the MBTA TPSS building. That's that big gray box um, it houses a lot of equipment for the Green Line extension. We have a project right now with the Arts Council to really enliven that and make that a really vibrant part of the square. Uh, and that is an RFP process to find an artist to decorate the exterior. Then on the left side of the screen, you see two boxes in orange. Those are the two private development sites that have been in discussion for the last couple of years. At the moment, they're both on pause, but we do expect that they are going to re-energize and uh, get moving again soon. I'm gonna turn it over now to Brian uh, to talk a little about stormwater. Good evening, everybody. Uh, so stormwater has been a concern of many neighbors throughout the city and in particular, the Gilman Square area. And to help address that three years ago, uh, the city uh, conducted a citywide urban flood model, uh, which you can see in uh, the output of that for the 100 year storm projected out to 2070, because we didn't just stay at the present, we moved, we projected out into the future. Um, but the uh, image in white and blue is that map that was developed. So the blue are all the flood areas uh, for a 100 year storm uh, in the city. Immediately following that, we rolled into a citywide drainage, ma uh, drainage master plan. Uh, for all seven drainage areas in the city, which you can see in the multicolored uh, drawing on the right. And, and Gilman Square is located in the S2 area. That drainage master plan is being completed this December, and we will be compiling and comparing the various uh, drainage projects that, de that developed out of that and we plan to distribute and discuss that with the community uh, regarding what those projects are and what prioritization uh, the administration will be proposing. Next slide, please. So 
So we've already con completed the S2 location, which is in Gilman Square. And thus we already have some preliminary recommendations that we can share. And the, the first one and primary, primary one that would address uh, flooding in Gilman Square proper would be a detention tank of about 850,000 gallons. Uh, and that would occupy an area of approximately 0.2 acres and be approximately 20 feet deep. The home in site was the site, uh, being that it's city owned, was the site that was selected to house and locate that and being immediately adjacent to the stormwater lines in Medford and Pearl Street, it provided a good location to be able to overflow from the street into the stormwater tank and then be pumped out after the storm, thus increasing effectively the capacity of the storm system during especially larger storms. The second element that we were looking at is green stormwater infrastructure. And this could be in, uh, included uh, bioretention, uh, bump outs, subsurface infiltration trenches, and sidewalk infiltration planter boxes. The goal is to provide these to the extent practicable in the Gilman Square project that we're working on, but also looking at where these can be located both upstream and downstream of Gilman Square to help relieve some of the capacity issues in our stormwater system so that we have more capacity to minimize uh, urban flooding. And I believe next is Christine Carlino. Sorry, I wasn't expecting that to come up so quickly. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, I'm Christine Carlino. I'm one of the now five board members of the Gilman Square Neighborhood Association. We actually just held our elections. Um, we're moving towards becoming a neighborhood council, which is really exciting. Um, and we just wanted to share with you some of the things that we've been working on. We've, of course, been um, working very closely with the city on a lot of these efforts. Um, we've done a ton of outreach to make sure that we are engaging um, all of our neighbors across Gilman Square and making sure that they're coming to these meetings and they're having their voice heard. Um, we also organize a, a whole bunch of events. We're, we're here to bring neighbors together so that we can all have the discussions that are necessary to build a better Gilman Square. And part of that is just getting to know each other and uh, sharing our life experiences. And so we, have, we had a block party this year, which was fantastic. Um, we've done a ton of visioning events, um, sometimes just with Gilman Square, sometimes in collaboration with uh, city folks, Viola and Rachel and, and OSPCD. Um, and so um, if you're interested in joining Gilman Square Neighborhood Association, I mean, it's really no major commitment. You can just come and listen in to meetings. You can come to events and have fun and meet folks, um, or you can get involved in some of the advocacy. Um, so you can reach out to us uh, by email at gilmansquaresomerville at gmail.com, um, or you could just casually join with us on Facebook. Uh, the, face the link to the Facebook group is here. I'm wondering if maybe we could throw that into the chat, I'm not quick or savvy with the technology. Rachel, do you think you could snip that? Yeah, I think when uh, we open the chat at the end, we can put those things in if I'm right. Um, oh, great. Okay, that yeah. gives me some time. <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, we hope to see everyone and I can't wait to hear what everyone thinks of the presentation. Thanks, Christine. And here is my computer being slow again. So the last thing that we would want to um, briefly mention before we hit the actual project that we want to cover is what's going on with GLX. And the three um, major questions obviously in the neighborhood are when will the bridges open? For Medford Street Bridge, we still hear from the GLX team that they're working on reopening this year. Um, the School Street Bridge reopening, we have not heard a date. And for the Gilman Square Station, um, the date of May 2022 is still what we are going by. So 
it's all coming sooner than later. And um, I know there've been a lot of delays, but um, I think we're getting very close and that's exciting. So with that, I wanna start um, <clears throat> with the Medford Street Pearl Street project and give you an overview of what we have been working on. So before I go into the present, I just wanna do a brief um, reminder, what was the last thing we had presented, which was last winter. And that was 20% design for the street and intersection improvements. And the plan here shows that we had proposed, or we are proposing a two-way bicycle lane, a connection between School Street and at that point, Marshall Street, um, a few raised intersections and um, raised crosswalks, raised intersections and uh, widened sidewalks. We're borrowing a little bit from the home inside. And then also the red uh, dashed area indicating the Medford Street Bridge closure. So the scope of the project as it is now, um, we, um, which we got funding, another grant opportunity that the city is matching with a little bit of money, is we hired a consultant Arab to um, first test the feasibility of an accessible path up, Redford, up Medford Street to Medford Street Bridge. And that's indicated in the Scion dashed one. That is just a feasibility study. There's no design part of this project. And then what is outlined in red is where the consultants will bring us from 20% to 60% design. And that will be including the School Street, uh, Medford Street Bridge intersection, and then all the way up to Skilton. The timeline for it is we are right now at the November public meeting. Um, November, December, we will um, host a survey and collect the feedback until middle of December. And then the design team will get us to 60% design by um, summer 2022. Um, the 100% we are predicting for spring 2023 with a fall winter start of construction that we're planning. So now I want to cover the um, first scope item of the team, which was the accessibility um, testing up the bridge. And <clears throat> just a few items that I want to um, stress is we've gotten a lot of questions. Um, why are we reopening or what is happening with the bridge when the GLX is done with the work and can we keep it closed? And we've always maintained that the bridge will reopen once GLX is done. But our vision is to close the bridge to vehicular traffic. Um, we will allow emergency access, obviously, and that will create a connection for pedestrian and pedestrians and bicycle riders. And um, our vision is of a lively outdoor space. In order to create that and not just keep it closed as it is, which will be pretty much dead space, we um, need a community and a design process. And currently, we are planning to start securing funding and consultants um, in 2022. So back to the current project and the um, feasibility study that the consultants did. So it was basically in the approach area, the red dotted, that is the area that leads more or less from Marshall Street slash Pearl Street up to the beginning of the bridge what is indicated as top of the bridge. And the top of the bridge is already um, ADA accessible, i.e. less than 5% in the slope. So it's not very steep and it will get you right to the community path and up to the high school. And then obviously the community path connection will get you to the Gilman Square station. And again, I wanna stress that this project has no design for the bridge, it's just showing us how easy or not is it to create this ADA access accessible path? So the consultants first looked at the existing grades and um, everything that shows in blue is actually less than 5% and everything in red is above 5%. So that's the area where we would currently have non-accessible sidewalks. And then the next, next slide shows that with a bit of regrading on our existing sidewalks, which is all within the scope of this project, 
except um, up the bridge, but along Pearl Street and Medford, um, we can create accessible way or connection up to the beginning of the bridge if we, which shows in the cyan areas, create a few ramps. And ramps is what we all know are the um, slightly steeper um, walkways up to entrances of buildings with railings and um, landings every 30 feet. They, um, they are long on one side and we, you know, show a little bit of a um, ramp that's shorter and it could be wrapped around green space. So this is just playing a little bit with options we would have. Again, this is not a proposed design. The final design will not look like it. Right now, it's just showing to us it's possible without huge retaining walls. And um, we see that as a great opportunity um, to create more than the access by a future elevator, but also by foot or you know, other means of transportation. So the next um, scope item we want to discuss now is um, the bike lanes and tree placements. So after we um, showed the concept last year, there was some question of like, do we really want a two-way bicycle lane or would it be better to have one-way bicycle lanes on each side of the road? So the um, consultants had looked, um, will have played with both um, options and we will see that in circulation diagrams and in sections. But before I get into that, I just want to mention that there were few assumptions made, like many of our projects in the city, timing is not always on our side. So a lot of things around it might not be um, ready or constructed by the time we hopefully start in Medford and Pearl Street. So the circulation diagrams will show a two-way bicycle lane on School Street, which is what our vision for right now is. But obviously it's not constructed and it's not within the scope of this project. Also the Medford Street and Pearl Street connection um, towards McGrath and towards Magoon. Currently, as we all know, don't have bicycle infrastructure. So you would ride on the road and then you would enter the Gilman Square um, improvements. However, our um, intent is that few in the future, those connections will be continuous with whatever bicycle infrastructure we decide to um, implement in Gilman Square now. And then the other thing that the consultants explored is where to place trees. And, um, and you'll see that how that changes the sections of um, both Medford Street and Pearl Street. So I just wanted to throw this circulation diagram up, which is always amazing how many different um, modes of transportation we're trying to accommodate in such, you know, on our fairly narrow streets. So the um, green are the bicycle connections. The um, pink ones show the pedestrian connections and you see in number four is the Richdale connector that Rachel mentioned earlier, which you know is will be part of the development. It also shows the entrances to the station, the T station. Number one shows the entrance on the Scion colored community path. And then on the left, um, the school street entrance. And then number three is our future Medford Street um, close bridge. And the um, two things, or one other thing I want to point out, the blue circles kind of indicate our neighborhood, neighbor way connections. So currently um, Montrose and Madison up the street on School Street are our neighbor ways. So there would be a connection up and down School Street. And then we want to make sure that whatever we implement here in Met on Medford and Pearl and Gilman Square connects to the neighbor ways that then lead to East Somerville. And they start on Skilton right now, go through at Leather Park and further down Gilman Street. So what would it look like if we do a two-way bike lane um, on the south side? Um, what does it mean for circulation? And then how many mixing zones will we have when we do that? And the mixing zones um, are the um, areas where bicycles have to watch out for vehicular traffic and or pedestrian um, traffic. So when you come down School Street, in this scenario at the 
intersection of um, school and Medford, you'd have to watch out for pedestrians or vice versa. Then um, you are without vehicular interaction, um, especially if in the future the Medford Street Bridge is closed all the way up until you go to Skilton and then you can enter Skilton without any conflicts with or having to watch out for cars. Um, you will have some uh, mixing zones with pedestrians. So overall, um, when you look at these dots, pedestrian mixing and vehicular mixing, um, we have about 15 of these mixing zones. For the one-way bicycle um, lanes in each direction, the circulation looks slightly different. You know, you would come down the um, school street and then going east, you have the same thing as the two-way bicycle lane, but coming from Skilton and going west towards School Street, you'd have to cross the street, um, go on the other side, and then cross the street again on School Street. This option obviously is easier for right now when you want to continue from McGrath, let's say all the way to Magoon and vice versa, because there you don't have to change um, streets to pick up the two-way bicycle lane that's only on one side. However, adding all these mixing zones, we have about 20 in this scenario. So now we get into the sections. And I hope um, it's not going to be too confusing or complicated, but it's basically all the option ones show a two-way line lane on one side with two options of where to place the trees, the A and B. And then option two is all the one-way lanes on each side with um, trees between side, side with, I'm sorry, with um, trees in two different locations. Just a reminder, the existing conditions both on Medford and Pearl are a plus or minus eight feet sidewalk on each side, um, parking lanes, and then two drive lanes. And it's about 50 feet right of way. So what could sections look like with a two-way bicycle lane on the home inside, which you see on the left, which is the southern side? Um, it will, and in this scenario, in both options one and twos, we will borrow from the home inside. So instead of only having 50 feet on Medford Street, we can have um, 70 plus feet of a right of way, which allows us to have a nicely wide sidewalk plus green and um, furniture zone. Then you have the two way bicycle lanes, each five feet with a buffer and then a parking or um, flex zone, which could be anything from a bus stop to holding blue bike station and then two drive lanes. And then on the other side, again, an eight foot sidewalk with an eight foot um, green and furniture zone. And if you look to the right, there the option is the tree is placed between the bicycle lanes and the parking and roadway. And just to point out a little bit what the difference means is in the option where the tree is between the bicycle lane and the furniture zone, it's obviously protecting pedestrians and bicycles. And, um, and the shade is more sidewalk um, bicycle lane it would require probably a better and not better, a larger canopy to then cast um, a shade on the southern side of the road drive, drive lane. Placing the trees between the road and the bicycle lane or the sidewalk obviously protects the um, bicycle lanes from the parked cars. It could also in this scenario, the buffer where the tree is sitting in, it can then be used for ADA um, space. The Pro Street is the, the same, is, is in this case, we only have 50, so we were working with it. So the sidewalk and the buffer areas are slightly narrower, um, but other than that, we can still do a two-way bicycle lane with two drive lanes, a buffer between the bicycle lane and the drive lane, and the trees will be a buffer between the sidewalk and the cars on, um, in both scenarios. And then on the right side, you see again, the tree, instead of being between the sidewalk and the bicyclist, it will be between the cars and the 
bicycle riders and the same pros and cons um, as on Medford Street. This is the option now with the one-way bike lane in each direction. This is on Medford Street. So um, again, we're borrowing from the home inside. So we still have ample sidewalk and um, green and furniture zone in both um, on both sides, north, south. In the um, trees is the same pros and cons. And um, for both, uh, in, yeah, for both sides, the north side and the south side. And Pearl Street, again, the same thing. We will have to go down to four and a half bicycle lanes in order to accommodate a buffer between the cars and the bicyclists in the scenario where the tree is between sidewalk and bicycle lane. And um, we kept the four and a half and in the scenario where the tree is between the cars and the bicycles just to give the tree a little bit room between it. Those are all the um, section options. I wanna briefly mention ADA parking. The, um, we indicated in both cases on Medford Street, both for the one way in each direction and the two way bicycle lanes that we can um, accommodate ADA parking. And what that basically means is we will create a five foot accessible um, island between the bicycle lanes and the cars. And we will borrow a little bit either from the bike lanes if we make them four, which is not what we're showing here. But even if we keep them five, we just make the, um, the buffer zone or the green furniture zone, um, basically just a zone where the trees are. So there, there are options. So just to briefly recap and compare, um, the two-way bicycle lanes, like the number of mixing zones versus the one-way bicycle lanes mixing zones, and then the minimum width of sidewalk on Medford Street and on Pearl Street in each of these um, scenario. I might have the number wrong for the minimum width on Pearl Street. It's my apology. I can double check. But, um, but it, the trend is generally that the one-way bicycle lanes um, will leave a little less space for the sidewalks on both Pearl Street and Medford Street. And then for the mixing zones, as I had mentioned earlier, there are slightly more than on the two-way bicycle lane option. And then the tree location, again, we talked about what it means to have it between sidewalk and bicycle lane and between bicycle lane and road parking, as far as shade goes and protection between different modes. So I know this was a lot of information and I'm sure there are lots of questions and comments and I'm happy to go back and forth on the slides. And I believe we're, um, before we start opening up the chat, or maybe um, Kate is already doing that, just want to mention a few things. So um, the dimensions, if I, I try to work that into the presentation a little bit, are not final. Um, this is just like showing, again, possibilities. But if it's a four-foot bicycle lane or five or a six, that, um, for example, is still to be determined in the next phase. What we really want to emphasize is we want to know what you think about the one way versus two way and the general location of the trees. And obviously we're, we're interested in other thoughts and questions and comments you have. Oops. I'm going to hand it over to Kate now. Thanks, Viola. We just want to remind folks again how to participate. So we're going to focus on written questions first. The chat is open, so please feel free to input your questions there, or questions and comments. And just a reminder that we'll do that for about 15 minutes, and then we'll move into the opportunity to speak out loud. Um, and just to participate in this, all you have to do is select your raise hand button. This can either be found on your reactions button on our toolbar. It could be directly on your toolbar, or it might be through your participants window. What we'll do is it will kind of call out the first three of the raise hands, you kind of know where you are in the queue. And if you are joining by phone, you can press star nine. Um, and again, if you have any technical difficulties, please don't hesitate to reach out to me by email at kwhite at silvervillema.gov or through the chat box. So I'll begin with some written questions. Um, 
so this is to the full panel. Um, could you please summarize the process that led to the closure of the Medford Square Bridge for vehicular traffic and where the city stands on this process? And I have a couple of additional questions to that. Yeah, I'm happy to start that. So when we um, worked on the 21st, 20 percent design, we worked with Howard Stein Hudson and we had um, two public meetings that spoke to that and we introduced the closure of the Medford Street Bridge. We got really exciting comments about it. We also got comments where people were worried about traffic. So Howard Stein Hudson did a traffic analysis and the outcome was that if we um, improve our intersections at Walnut and Pearl and at school, um, especially you know on the traffic signal side, then the waiting times on those intersections and around um, are actually not that much longer. And Viola, I just have a couple of follow-up questions around the Medford Square Bridge. Um, has there been an impact study defining the effect of the bridge, bridge's closure? And can you describe some of the efforts made to contact neighbors on Pearl and Medford streets and publicize this to residents in other state Somerville neighborhoods? Yeah, based back when we did the 20% public meeting, we did do our general outreach where we announced it on the city website. And I'm not, um, I have to admit, I don't know what we did for flyering. That was also a meeting that was done with economic development with, um, Sunyana Thomas was not with us anymore. She was leading that outreach pro process. Um, but we also had the um, phone calling before the meeting. So that is as far as I know, we did the outreach. And um, as I said, the impact study, the most concerns were that it would um, increase traffic um, times at the intersections and people would be stuck in traffic. And that was what the Howard Stein Hudson traffic study looked at. And we felt very, fairly confident that that is not going to increase traffic that much, traffic times. Thanks, Viola. So I have another question for the panel. Um, was the Mayor's Commission for Persons with Disabilities consulted about their pre um, preferences of the tree placement? Yes, the um, Commission for Persons with Disability was sent this presentation prior. And um, so they did see the tree locations and um, I did not receive any concerns about that. So Rachel, this might be a question for you. Can you tell us how people can volunteer for the community focus group? Yes, yeah, so we are going to send out an email to everyone here uh, with the link to the application. Uh, it's not quite ready yet, but we're hoping to have it out tomorrow. And if not tomorrow, certainly by Monday of next week. Thanks. So my next question is, is there a connection between Skilton and the community path? I'm, I'm like putting a map out now. No, the connection on Skilton is to the neighbor ways, and that is through at Leather Park and then um, onto Gilman Street. Um, the community path does have a um, connection on Walnut Street. So you could go from Skilton through at Leather up Walnut Street. Um, although you have to be in pretty good shape. That's one of the steeper sections of Walnut Street. Thanks, Viola. And um, that actually segues into this next question. Um, can you describe what is a neighbor way for those who might not have heard of it before? Yes, as I saw that in the chat. Um, neighbor ways are, are our low stress um, side streets or residential streets where we, with, um, where the long-term goal is to have intersections that indicate slow speed, um, where we are planning to have traffic coming along the street. And in the two, three, three years prior to this, we started doing that by painting intersections and bulb outs on the inter, like extended um, crosswalk, in, indicating extended crosswalks on intersections. And, um, the neighbor ways also um, have these fun in this initial phases um, murals on the street, which not only um, was supposed to slow down the speed, and it did. We did before and after traffic data, traffic um, speeds, but it also has that strong community aspect. 
So the goal is at one point, you know, that we really get traffic slow enough that people feel more comfortable, you know, if the sidewalk is too narrow to step onto the street. And, um, and we saw that in the shared streets program last year where we tried to um, piggyback, so to speak, on the neighbor ways concept. So the, my next question is around crosswalks in the project area. Can you describe if there are plans to be, if there are plans for any raised crosswalks? Yes, the, the concept at the 20% already um, indicates raised crosswalks. And we have every you know, intention to include that in the 60% set. So I have two questions around bus stop locations. Um, would, would, oh, someone asked why is the bus number or the bus route 80 stop not closer to the station? And then an additional question to kind of um, to pair with that is have potential bus stop locations been considered for new potential north-south MBTA bus lines on school and any alterations to the route 80? Yeah, I'm not so familiar with, with all the new things that are coming out of the MBTA effort. I know we in the city have a bus network. Um, and Justin, I'm going to um, refer to you now because I think you are the co-project manager on that, but working also on how where we want bus buses to go. Uh, yeah, the, so the MBTA is doing a bus network redesign that's looking to redo the bus network and simplify routes. And I can put the link to that process in the chat in a minute. And then I know here internally in Somerville, we're putting together our own transit network plan with our priorities. So there's going to be meetings on that um, in the future. And definitely North-South bus service is on our list of priorities. But you know, not, not a part of this project, but definitely something that's on the city's mind for the future. So Phil, I'm just going to pivot back to connections to the community path real quick. I forgot to add, um, are there going to be uh, curb cuts added to connect the neighborway at Gilman? Currently, there are no curb cuts to get in and out of the park from Skilton to Gilman. Yeah, we are um, definitely going to see that next year. We were hoping to have our con have contracts in place to do that this year. It didn't work out, but yes, we are. Um, we have a consultant on board, which is separate from the Gilman Square project. It's actually coming out of engineering, and I don't know, Brian, if you want to talk a little bit about it. But um, we're definitely including the um, curb cuts in a, in a real connection through Edward at the at Leather Park. Yeah, Viola, that's, uh, that's correct. Um, we are moving forward with our uh, next year's design project for street reconstruction, uh, which is going to include a number of uh, pedestrian safety intersection improvements. And one of those will be uh, surrounding Ed Leathers Park to create those connections. So Brian, this might actually the fault. The next question might be for you as well. Um, is the city designing a better connection across Walnut um, from Ed Leathers to Gilman Street? So I believe that's the same question, if I'm not mistaken. If it isn't, that was the one that I was I thought I was answering. So, so we, I think it's both ends. We got questions oh, about oh, both, both ends. ends. I yeah. see. I see. Yeah. So, so we will be connecting both ends, creating a connection on the Walnut side, connecting to Gilman, and on the Skelton side, uh, connecting to Skelton. So the answer is yes. Thanks, Brian. Um, so the next question is: Will the bike lane be at the level of the road or at the level of the sidewalk? It will be on the level of the sidewalk. Both in both scenario, what we're envisioning is the um, protected bike lanes or raised bike lanes. Yes. So the next question is on sidewalk width. Could you clarify? Are you proposing to make sidewalk about the sidewalk on Pearl at Skilton narrower? I don't believe so. Now I can go back. So the current one is eight. And if we keep the trees, so it's the, the tree and the sidewalk will be eight feet. So 
it's a yes or no. If you if you're strictly how I present it is the sidewalk will be narrow, it won't be eight feet, but it will also have a row of trees, which then um, will get you to eight feet. And um, in the scenario where the tree is between the bicycle lane, you're right, that will be a little less, um, especially, but that is because we do the two foot buffer to indicate, especially for our ADA um, residents um, to um, protect them from running, to just walking into the bicycle lanes. And we will add the three foot between the bicycle lane and the drive lane. So you will still have the additional tree in that scenario. So Fiola, we might wanna put the slide onto option 1B because that's what our, our next question is referring to. Um, the question is, is there an opportunity to add a third row of trees interspersed within the foot, four foot um, bench zone? This would add additional shade onto two way bike zone. Yeah, that is a really good comment. And, and that's the beauty of this. We can sort of do the mix and match and um, that is an excellent um, suggestion and we will, um, consider that. The next question is on um, ADA parking. Is there a legal requirement for ADA parking or is this um, something that we want to include in a desired design? I will um, let Brian answer that. Sure. So there is not a requirement uh, for ADA parking on the public streets. Uh, however, there are requirements if you do provide it, there are, um, there are standards that you should meet. Uh, but like many design elements, uh, we do things because they're the right design and uh, they're the right facilities to provide for the residents in our community. Uh, so that is one of those elements that we would be including in this because that's the right design element for our community. And, and I want to add to that, that we are aware, obviously, that there will be a station entrance from Gilman Square once the new development happens and we have every intention to include a, an additional entrance via a um, elevator and that we want to make sure that there are pickup and drop off zones and, you know, ADA parking would be one of it. So our next question is, um, is there a strong desire line going from the graph through Medford Street? If there's a strong desire line, it seems that it would be a consideration for separate lanes on each side. I believe there is a strong desire line because we have the East Somerville Community School and you know people will take that Pearl Street. And as far as the, if that points to the one way bicycle lane on each side, I was trying to say that we, um, if we decide to do the two-way bicycle lane, once we do the um, redesign of Pearl Street between Skilton and McGrath, which I'm gonna um, refer to Brian on, on when we might see that, um, we would then try to continue whatever we decide to do in Gilman Square. So either one way on each side or two way. Um, and that should be a full possibility. And Brian, I, I refer to you because I believe it's in our five-year pavement plan. Are, are you referring to the connection through Skelton Park? Nope, um, no. on Pearl Street from Skelton to McGrath. From Skelton to McGrath. Uh, okay, so that section of Pearl Street is not in the current year's uh, project uh, and it is on the uh, extended five-year plan but exactly where it lies in that five-year plan. It hasn't been given a specific year yet. So I think I'll move on to the next question. Um, one person asked, if you do choose the two-way option, can you add in automatic signals that give people biking a green wave that they would need to cross the street to get to the two-way path? Yeah, I think in the um, for the next steps, we will work with the consultants to even see what um, signaling is necessary. I think in general, we prefer not to have the signals if that gives a, an equal safe option. So we will play with designs and make sure that um, we create designs where the conflict between pedestrians, vehicular traffic and 
um, bicycle riders are, you know, the least conflict written. <laughs> and if we can do that, then yes, we would look into um, signaling options, but that, that is to be determined in the next few months. Great, so um, I know we still have some more questions coming in. I'm gonna uh, tackle three more questions in the chat, then make sure we pivot to out loud questions and comments. Then we can always come back to some of the written questions that we didn't get to if we have some time. Um, our next one is someone shared that they worried about the reopening of the Medford Street Bridge and then closing again and it could be confusing for people. Have we considered a tactical inter intervention in, um, in the time being so it can be used by people in the short term, meaning it, you know, using it as just a cycling and walking bridge and keeping it close to cars? I'm gonna start this and then let Rachel talk a little bit. Like Rachel and I have been working with um, consultants to talk about quick build options on the Medford Street Bridge. And then, um, so we have some ideas of elements that we could use to, um, temporarily close Medford Street Bridge. And Rachel, I, I will let you speak if you want. Yeah, so one of the ideas we've been talking about is that we would close it in more of an event style format. So rather than it being, because we don't have a full design. So in sort of these key event moments, we would um, close the bridge, put out some really great tactical um, interventions, make it really lively and make it a really fun activity. So we've been talking with the Gilman Square Neighborhood Association a little bit about that idea, um, as well as thinking about how we might interact with the high school and particularly Fabville that just reopened at the high school. So Fabville is a um, project through the Economic Development Office and many others um, to create opportunities for fabrication um, machine access at the high school itself. And that space is now open from 3 to 8 p.m. Um, most days, many days of the week. Um, we can connect you there if anyone's interested, um, but they did just reopen in the last couple of weeks. So now that they're getting um, sort of back on their feet and moving again, uh, we're looking at how we can engage and really think about uh, in the spring, getting some events out there uh, for people to enjoy. So Rachel, our next question might also be for you. Um, has a small like, or, um, super, or a supermarket concept been considered for the Holman site? Yeah, so we're really at the early stages of collecting ideas for what uses at the home and site um, will look like. Uh, the first step was really to understand what size buildings and building footprints would fit. And that next layer when we come back together, um, specifically to talk about the home and site's future, will be to dig into ideas for new uses at that property um, and sort of what the community priorities are as they're um, particularly around those ground floor uses because that is such a, a critical aspect to the neighborhood. Thanks, Rachel. So um, the last written question I'll ask before we pivot to um, loud, or out loud comment is about outreach. Um, someone asked, um, how are the people of Pearl Street Park being considered with regard to the redesign of the triangular park between Medford and Pearl? And how does the consideration of um, the Pearl Street Park residents affect the topics of this evening? So I can take the first part of that. Um, when it comes to the triangle, we are going to be doing some direct outreach to them about getting them engaged in that focus group and also those larger meetings around the future of these sites. Um, the only person I've spoken to so far was actually at the Gilman Square Neighborhood Association's block party. A resident came up and said, you know, they'd love to see more places to sit that are easy um, to access. Um, but there's a lot of other perspectives that we're going to need to uh, bring in as well and bring in as many residents from that community as we can. And then Kate, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about when we did the flyering and sort of um, what our higher capacity of outreach is now since you are on board, since you became. Yeah, thanks Viola. Um, so we did wanna make sure to um, deliver um, flyers to people living at Pearl Street Park and along or, and visited the businesses around Gilman Street or Gilman Square. Um, we also plan to do some more in-person outreach so um, setting up shop for a day, bringing some coffee and seeing if people want to come and share their comments or um, take any feedback surveys with us. So those are what we hope to do to kind of get input on um, more specifically the street design. We're also partnering in, um, and collaborating with the Council on Aging and um, the Somerville Housing Authority.
So with that, um, we'd love to have some opportunities for questions and comments um, from attendees. Um, Viola, if you could take us back to the slide again with the Zoom instructions. Um, just a reminder, um, you can just use the raise hand function. I'm going to call the first three people out and, and then again, we'll unmute you and you can ask your question and comment. Right now we have um, four attendees with their hands raised. So just again, be mindful that we can to give all of each other space and time to share each other's comments um, and those coming after you. So we'll start first with uh, Christina. Um, I'm gonna unmute you now. Hi, my name is Christina. Um, I was wondering, just to kind of take a big step back, why do we even need all of this bike infrastructure on the road when the community path is like yards away? Hi, Christina. Thanks for asking that. And we hear that quite a bit. Um, the community path is one way to get everybody on their bikes. I mean, it's nice and separated, but it is only 10 feet wide and it is up the hill from Gilman Square. And it's quite a schlep, um, especially on School Street. And that is one of the reasons why we still think um, a connection to any of our hubs and neighborhood activity centers will have to be made and not only from the community path but also the connection on Medford Street Bridge is important so that that is a less steep connection then to the community path. Plus the connections um, through Gilman Square and then up to City Hall, it's all one big circulation. And if you recall the circulation diagram, it's not just that you have the community path and then what do you do to get to Gilman Square? And then the other connection that we just discussed is um, from East Somerville, the natural connection is from Pearl Street all the way down to um, through Gilman Square. And so it's the community path will be great, but it will not be our only way um, of providing uh, non vehicular travel through the city of Somerville. Um, I have some additional questions. Should I raise my hand again? They're, they're like unrelated. <laughs> Christina, you're welcome too, and then we'll move on to, um, just to make sure it'll be Ben, Seth, and Wig next. Okay, um, so how many parking spots are you eliminating and how many, um, like what are the people on Pearl Street supposed to do? Like you're, you're making our side streets parking lots. There's so many cars jammed in now because you're taking away all the spots on our major roads you know, this kind of goes to my next question. I guess these two are related. I, I didn't feel like the answer about outreach to residents really addressed the question. Like I live near Broadway. No one knocked on my door when you were taking away parking spots and putting in the bike and bus lane. So, uh, yeah. So first, so first question, how many parking spots are being eliminated? Um, you're expecting people to park on side streets, I guess, yes or no. And then um, please go further into direct outreach to people who live along the street and directly abutting the street. So the, the parking question, I don't have the numbers of elimination since especially we, we're still working on the um, final design. But um, I know that when we, well, I shouldn't even, I shouldn't even say that because we have a great new citywide parking study and Justin, I'm, I assume we covered this area too. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the answer to the first part of the question is that we don't know yet because this is not fully designed and we're just getting to 60% design now. Um, but Viola referenced the citywide parking study, which is going on right now. And I can throw a link in the chat to that. Um, and it includes um, surveying every street in the city so we know where all the parking is and going through and doing occupancy counts on about 30 miles of streets to figure out how people park and when they park and how often parking spaces turn over. Um, so I don't want to spend too much time on that topic, but I'll throw the link in the chat and folks can go and check out some of the preliminary data. We had a public meeting a couple of weeks ago and there's lots of interesting information about 
the, the density of parking permits, where that's higher, where that's lower. Um, and it does tend to be significantly lower near existing transit stations. So let me just throw that information in the chat. Yeah, and Kate, again, I wonder if you can speak a little bit of what our um, ideas are to reach residents. Yeah, thanks, Viola. Um, so we we do want to get out to people as much as possible to let them know and, and request feedback and, or provide feedback. Um, and we know that this is there's opportunities like public meetings, but also again, you know, sending out notices, whether that's email, text, or calls, um, stopping by and flyering um, residences. And again, we'll have opportunities to provide that feedback um, after this meeting today. I think next we have Seth. Seth, I'm gonna unmute you now. Hi there, Kate, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Wonderful. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for the presentation uh, this evening. Uh, my name is Seth Hurwitz. I live on Maple Avenue, just off of School Street. Um, and I recognize that this is the very beginning of kind of the public outreach. Um, so. Just once again, I appreciate the slides that have been put together. I appreciate the outreach you did with the Gilman Square Neighborhood Association to bring those members up to speed on what the questions and concerns are about Pearl Street and Medford Street. Um, I often walk down Pearl Street, walk up Medford Street, bike on both streets, drive on both streets. And one of the things that I noticed in the slides is that it looks like the car travel lanes are being widened slightly from 10 feet to 10 and a half feet. It's a small difference. And I don't know if it'll make that big of an impact, but having lived near Medford Street for many years now and seeing how just even a slightly wider street encourages cars to travel much, much faster and how unsafe that makes me and a lot of my neighbors feel. And also just seeing the very unsafe things that happen because of wider car travel lanes. I'm wondering if there's any rationale or explanation for why that widening is gonna happen on Pearl Street, um, and I can't remember if Medford Street's being widened too a little bit, but basically I would love to see the car travel lanes stay as narrow as is feasible to encourage cars to slow down and be more careful as they drive through the neighborhood because we often see a lot of speeding there and it would make it a lot safer, I think, for pedestrians and for cyclists. Hi, Seth. Thanks for asking that in public meeting. I, I know you've emailed me twice and I was hoping that, you'd, <laughs> that you would raise this question um, at the meeting. Um, so I have not ignored you. The, the, reason, okay. the reason why we asked our consultants to use 10.5, that is the absolute minimum that we hear from the MBTA that they want to see it for their buses. And since we do have bus, you know, buses go down Medford and Pearl Street and because we, um, a can accommodate that one additional foot by borrowing it from the um, home inside, at least on Medford. And even on Pro Street, it seems to be not hindering us to do protected bike lanes and still adequate sidewalks. And to your question about speeding, I mean, we see the half a foot in addition on each drive lane, not gonna add that much speeding, especially with all the other like race crosswalks and an overall um, much different environment with street trees who also have the effect of traffic calming and um, hopefully a much more active square. But the, it, it, this, as I said, um, dimensions are not set in stone. And if we can work with the MBTA and our um, fire department, who's also been really struggling on Pearl Street with the narrow um, drive lanes. And that was one of the reasons why we initially took away the parking for when the bridges were closed on Pearl Street. So if we can work with those entities and get there okay, then I mean, all of us would like to see um, the drive lanes as narrow as possible. You know, we just had a quick Let's question in the, in the chat, just when we're referring to specific design elements, if we could go back to those slides. Sure. And if you wanna quickly show that again. Um, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, then I think we have Wig next. Wig, I'm gonna unmute you. 
Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so I, I've been asking about the um, Pearl Street Park residents because I walk through there every day, walk through Ed Leathers every day. I think it's a, a terrific neighborhood park um, as opposed to citywide park. And, um, you know, Pat, well, first, first, let me say, I think Gilman Street is undervalued because it, it goes under McGrath. So for some people uh, who don't need speed, it's actually um, quite, quite a nice way to get back and forth. I mean, I, I, I don't mind going up on McGrath. That's interesting view too. But anyway, um, the, the residents of Pearl Street Park, because of the ramps that go up to the front door, they cluster at the corners of the building and they really have nowhere to go. And um, on the triangle side, um, and I know this isn't what you're technically presenting tonight, but it's kind of part and parcel of how these things mix together. And on that triangle side across from Sarma, I think there's a real opportunity right now. The seniors who kind of escape across the border just have one bench to sit on. And that triangle, if it could be kind of looped around with something that has a really gentle slope, they could use it during the day. And um, I mean, I, I don't, I can't really afford expensive restaurants, but Sarma is really quite an asset for the neighborhood too. And I think some Sarma customers might be able to wander across into that triangle and, and eat, you know, takeout or whatever as well. So I think that could be an interesting multimodal place. Um, the other little thing that I mentioned is <clears throat> once you get past Leathers and the dog park and you've got that little um, remnant, uh, I assume it's a, a rail building uh, that's got the kind of odd shape uh, narrow shape. You've got a little green strip there, and and there are some other um, older guys who, you know, put out some plastic seats and plastic table, and sometimes they bring a portable radio, and the teenagers busted it all up and put it on the tracks. Um, and so I'm wondering, and again, I apologize because I know this isn't your your kind of street design. Um, mechanics of tonight, but that would be a great place for a little intervention with some more permanent um, wooden furniture or, or something just right in that narrow strip up against, up against the track area. Um, because there, there is a small population that fits in well there, you know, the guy's got his motorcycle back there and there's some other stuff and uh, there's some old cars and and they fit well with the artists to the big artist building in in that block. So I I just wanted to mention those little things. Um, I will also also say, even though tonight's not about the community path, given its narrowness, but also given that it has it does have green borders, and I know the city and the tree advocates and green advocates will do a lot of sustainable planting there. But even though it's not as lush as the community path from Davis to, um, to Lowell Street, you're gonna need some little places for people who can't go fast to break out, you know, little bench areas or little places for, for kids to pull aside if they're on the path with their parents and that kind of thing. So um, I thank you for, for letting me throw those in, even though they're more about compatibility with tonight's presentation than the main focus of it. Thanks, Wick. Um, I I absolutely hear you on the need for seating, and you know, as you said, for the um, street project, we will try to incorporate street furniture and seating, and hopefully, the residents of the parks um, building can benefit from that too. And then I assume all the other areas, I mean, the community path, as you noted, we we are working with the MBTA to see what we are allowed to put on their MBTA land. And um, and the other strip that you were talking about, is that on skill, like the extension of Skilton along the yeah, railroad? Yeah, exactly. It, it's, the, yeah. it's the street that comes out parallel to the Pearl Street Park building yeah. into Pearl Street. And... Um, 
but it's at the end of that there's a there's a there's a narrow green strip and there are there are a couple guys that that hang out there almost every afternoon and it's it's their stuff that got destroyed mm -hmm. about three or four weeks ago and um you know they they didn't complain about it but it you know it's just it just is a little tiny strip that can add a little bit of variety and you know the dog park is is spectacular especially friday nights it's like the social center of town when i walk through thank you thanks mike so next we have ben and then after that we have michelle oh maybe not um so we just have michelle next um michelle i'll meet you now Michelle, are you able to unmute yourself? Okay. Can you hear yep, me now? We can, we can hear you. I can be, I can be the commercial. Um, I manage Pearl Street Park and the area that Wig is talking about. First of all, Skilton Ave between Pearl Street Park and Stewart's building, the sign building next door, is private. It belongs to both our properties. It does not belong to the city. But the end of it that Wig is talking about is part of our property. Yes, they are our tenants. And I was really sad to hear what happened to their parking. But the T also has an easement to that area. So as far as, I guess, um, offering permanent seating area there, um, it is private property. I don't mind it for the tenants, obviously, nothing at all do I mind. But to give the impression that it would be open would create a liability issue for us, I guess. So, and when I asked about, um, I'm sorry, I asked about narrowing the sidewalk here in front of Pearl Street Park. There is a bus stop there and it's very narrow between where that, um, I'm sorry, enclosure is and the street. We can barely get a snowblower in front of it right now. So I have a concern about any kind of narrowing of the sidewalk right there. That's Thank it. Thanks, Michelle. Okay. Okay, next we have Jessica, Ben, then Matthew. Jessica, I'm muting you now. Hi there, thank you so much. Um, I, um, I'm um, very glad you guys are doing this and um, just had one small comment. Um, actually, I think it was Swig that brought up the, the dog park. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't uh, really know if that's on um, private property or really part of this project. It doesn't sound like it. But um, one thing that I did notice is then actually sort of unfortunately uh, um, ran into quite literally was, uh, you know, the dog park gate actually opens out onto the sidewalk and um, can, if, if someone happens to be, you know, adventurous enough to ride their bike through there, which I do, um, the gate can hit them quite easily. So I was just wondered if that's something that can be addressed while you're thinking about those connections through there. Um, and um, definitely agree that the Gilman Street is really good cut through if you don't want to cross the death trap that is McGrath Highway. So um, just, yeah. <laughs> um, regarding uh, the one way versus two way, I, I, I don't really have too much of an opinion, um, but um, I think that it's, it's great to see all those options out there. So just thank you for doing this. And um, I'm sure that you'll come up with a good choice there. I do like trees, so that would be nice to have the buffer. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Okay, so again, we have Ben next, then Matthew. Ben, I'm unmuting you now. Hey, I'm Ben Algar. I live on School Street and uh, I'm a member of the Gilman Square Neighborhood Association. Um, I uh, 
am really excited about how broadly you're thinking about what we can do in the street, um, how we can knit together the sidewalk, uh, bike lanes, and driving areas. Um, this kind of innovation isn't something you always see, and you know it's like pushing the limits. It's Columbus Avenue bus lane Boston style thinking. So I, I appreciate that. Um, the the comment I wanted to share um, was kind of around the idea of um, both lanes on one side. I I know it's not a very long stretch, and so I was kind of um, I. I don't have a good sense of how um, it will serve people who aren't gonna move very far through the square uh, if they will have to um, make connections on, uh, you know, whether it's um, up, up street on Medford or further on on Pearl, um, because they, they won't be um, driving continuously for very long. And so um, I think even though it's protected, it's, it's not going to help people connect uh, onto the next part of their route, whether they're coming or going. And so I, I don't see it serving quite, quite as well as some longer stretches where it is great to be protected and it's great to be among um, other um, uh, vehicles that are similar to yours. Um, but are there any thoughts about like what uh, a two lane bike or two-way bike lane and how, what the dimensions are, how long it can be. I'd be curious to hear more on that. And feel before we hop into answering, I'm just a reminder if we could show those slides again. Mm -hmm. Hey Ben, thanks, thanks for that comment. And I assume you mean um, that right now, just Gilman Square will be a short strip of two-way if we continue to have one way or no bicycle infrastructure towards McGrath or towards Magoon, is that correct? Yeah, especially because I know that um, we managed to repave Medford and, and there were no even bike lanes installed. So um, my my sense is that it's, it's not um, something that would be able to continue. Yeah, and I, I was hoping I, I tried to say that that the connection to McGrath um, is actually on the books, as Brian said, not immediately, but in the um, five year plan. So that's that's within the um, construction time frame, I'd say, of this. So I I would venture to say that if we decide on one way bike lanes on each side, we will continue that treatment all the way to McGrath. And if we do the two-way bicycle lane, we continue that all the way to McGrath as well. So that then is automatically a longer stretch. And I think that would be well worth either treatment and mm -hmm. would continue that, um, would create that continuation that you were talking about. And then the connection with Ingleman Square, I mean, I see it as a vibrant center that even if you are just riding your bike on one side um, and park it on that side, it's an easy hop to the other side. So I don't think you, you know, th that connection within, even if it is a short stretch, I think is is a viable one. But I, I definitely hear the concern about the continuation along Medford Street and um, Pearl Street. Thank you. Sorry, I got sidetracked and didn't bring up the plan, but I will try to do it with the last question. So we have one more hand raised um, and I wanna make sure we also have some time to show next steps. So the next person has their hand raised is Matthew. Matthew, I'm unmuting you now. Hey everyone, uh, this is Matt Carlino, Common Square Neighborhood Association member. Um, I wanted to thank everybody that presented with um, today. I think you guys are doing a tremendous amount of work and we really appreciate having a really supportive city kind of working with us as neighbors and community members to, to really dive into something like this, which is rather progressive. And I think it's gonna really benefit everybody no matter which option we do. Um, I have two kind of like semi-related comments because I think I, I bombarded Viola with, with enough of my comments already. <laughs> 
Um, so I kind of wanted to chat about two things. And one, after hearing what a couple of commenters had um, previous, might not be an option, but um, one is in Skilton Ave, which I just found out is a, a private road rather than a, a city owned one. But there seems to be like an abandoned building next to the dog park. And I was noticing like walking through that you could almost get a direct connection if there was an elevator in that building up to the midpoint of the Medford Street Bridge, which if that became like an auxiliary entrance might solve some of the mobility issues. I know it's putting an elevator in an area that's kind of like not in the square, but behind. But, you know, if, if someone ever decides to develop that site, it, it could be a win-win to have an additional accessible route just to somewhere on Midford Street at the bridge level. Um, it might also be easier to tie in because that's like a steel structure. Um, but my other, what, what I wanted to ask was, and since we are going to potentially be reopening that Medford Street bridge area after GLX is done, is there any way to just temporarily set up like a flex post barricade, kind of how School Street is now, that if emergency vehicle wanted to go through, they could just run those over. And then on the other side of the street, have like two six foot counter flow like bike lanes so that it's like established that there's sidewalks, there is only bicycles on this road. Like maybe we'll get some, can get some paint on it so that we can just establish it as a bikeway and then have an area next to it that's for emergency vehicles. This way it doesn't start the, everyone's gonna drive on it as soon as it reopens. Yeah, Matt, I, I appreciate that. And and as Rachel said, we're definitely working on some quick builds where we could do what you just described and try things out. But we're still feeling pretty strongly that the Medford Street Bridge closing is a big step. And we are totally committed to it, but we also committed to a public process and public engagement. And that means we, we will have to work with residents and everybody around Gilman Square and beyond to um, make everybody understand and including us, what are the impacts. And so that process is not gonna happen overnight. And, and we, we are committed to doing that as well. And then as far as um, the rest of the bridge, I mean, we've all seen empty parking lots or even empty abandoned lots. They don't look good, they don't feel good. And we see that as a great danger if we close the bridge now, that a majority of it will just look empty and people will not be excited and it will be much harder to sell something that doesn't feel used. So that's another reason why we feel like a proper design process. And then even once we have a designer on board, we can be creative and do quick builds and do temporary closings. And we can talk about how these temporary closings are working. You know, is it like a month? Is it every weekend? Is it once a quarter? All these things Rachel and I have thrown around and they will become a much more reality, as Rachel said, as the um, weather becomes nicer and we're heading into the next year. Awesome, thank you. I, I think we all agree that like our hope is that it whatever happens is wildly successful. So yeah, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. And I want to shout out to you too. I mean, Matthew is doing a lot and um, he sent me some really nice um, renderings and hopefully we can share them at one point. Awesome, thanks. Okay. Thanks everyone. Um, so we have no more hands raised. Um, so Viola, do you want to talk a little bit about next steps? Yes, I can do that. And my apology that I go through these slides one by one. I have not figured out how to scroll effectively, clearly. So um, the next step is that we will post this presentation within the next few days, hopefully tomorrow, and also post a survey. It's a very simple survey. It's basically asking you for your preference of the two-way bicycle lanes and the preference of the trees with comments that you can add. 
we will have that survey open until um, December 16th. And um, you can visit Summer Voice page as well for other information as we have them, we will post it and also a video of this um, presentation. And as Kate had said before, if you have any additional questions, feel free to email transportation at summervillema.gov. And also um, you can, through the Summerville webpage, get our personal contact and feel free to reach me or Justin or Kate if you find that more comfortable, feel more comfortable with that. And I just want to add to what Fiola said is that we're going to also email this all. Anyone who registered for the meeting tonight will email this all to you. So even though it'll be up on the project website, you'll get an email in your inbox with all of this information. And then a big thank you to everybody. Thank you for showing up. And um, that is probably one of the greatest ways to participate and give your feedback. And we will try our our utmost to reach special groups and individuals, but in the end, these meetings are a great way to hear from you all. Wonderful, thank you so much, everyone. We hope you have a wonderful evening. Take care. Take care. <laughs>